If you want one of those frameable memories of Kenya's astounding natural beauty, visit the Abadea Ranges. They'll knock you out. But like many other things in Kenya, its beauty and the usefulness of the rivers that spring from here shouldn't be taken at face value. The Abadeas have quenched our thirst as a country for millennia. It's what ties all Kenyans together, if you think about it. This water pillar feeds the cities. It feeds our countryside and it feeds our pastoral communities downstream from here. But this wonderful looking waterfall and the many that surround it here in the Abadea Ranges is hiding something from you. The waters that flow down from the Abadeas aren't reaching where they used to. And that means that a disaster is on the horizon for the pastoral communities that depend on the river that flows from the Abadeas. The Iwasonyiro. My name is John Alanamu. I'm a Kenyan investigative reporter, and I'm on a journey. I'm following these streams down from where they start, high above most of Kenya, down to where they join to form one of northern Kenya's most iconic rivers, the Iwasongiro. But the story I'm looking for is about the people who depend on it. From when the river is full, to the beginning of the worst drought in 10 years. I want to understand the story behind the drying up river and the conflict that comes when the river ends. I will fight with a panga, with a spear, with my own teeth. No day I will live here. And I have told my sons, who are seven, none should leave this place. They should better perish because I got them from this soil and I will, I, I will have to fertilize this soil again. Mount Kenya is here and the Abadeas is here. Mount Kenya and the Abadeas ranges. Where we have got these water towers, okay, is where already the cloud system are based, okay? And remember, these are the regions which are feeding the whole of this region and even they feed Lake Victoria. And some of this water also feeds to the Indian Ocean. Okay? So, in the absence or in the presence of the climate change and things now change here, they will certainly change the lifestyle of virtually everybody in this area. Between the months of October 2016 and April 2017, all forecasts have shown that Kenya will be in the middle of one of the worst droughts in almost 10 years. But because it's hot now, many of us Kenyans will have forgotten that just a year earlier, this was one of the wettest periods in almost a decade. We were in the middle of El Nino. a weather phenomenon characterized by very high amounts of rainfall. In particular, if you look at the El Nino phenomenon, we know that we had an El Nino phenomenon in 2015, which, and that was as strong as the one we had in 97 and 98. These are two very strong El Ninos. So what we're now seeing, we're seeing the tail of that. We had a failure in the short rains last year, and it is very likely, I think it, the forecast is that the long rains will also be affected. It is part of the phenomenon. For a long time now in Kenya, we've seen reports of the effects of drought in some of the driest parts of our country, which is over 70% of Kenya's landmass. Rainfall levels in December were too low to reverse the dry spell in counties. A devastating drought is swelling through the northern, southern and eastern parts of the country. What is being described as the worst drought to hit the country since 2011. In September 2009, during the last La Nina period, I reported on one effect of drought. 
violence, a serious inter-clan conflict over pasture in what is now Isiolo County, Kenya's geographical center and a gateway to the north. It always bothered me that beyond going to the battleground then, I never really heard the stories of those fighting. I've come back exactly eight years later, this time around to hear the stories of the people who over the course of the droughts unfolding will be the hardest hit by extreme weather. I start at Archer's Post, a trading post where most of Isiolo's communities like the Borana, the Turkana and the Samburu meet. It's a livestock market day. People come from far away. It's a good time to make a sale. Grass and water are still available, so most of the animals here are healthy and will fetch a good price. But this is the tail end of the good times. Already, water levels in the Owasongiro River are looking quite low. I want to hear what local herders are thinking about the times ahead. I'm introduced to Lautiriman Letwo. We meet at the noisy mouth of the Iwasongiro. He agrees to take us into Samburu County, where a group of his friends are herding their family's livestock. And the further into our trip we get, the drier and harsher the landscape begins to look, and the search for water is on. This village on our way to Lotiriman's friends is a perfect example of what happens when grass around the homestead is no longer available. Apo. Apo, apo. <sighs> Nalparemo Salenyi's husband is already out with their family's herd. Pepe. Salama. Mambo. Hi, tunaenda sasa. She's been left behind with their four children, although it's about a month earlier than she had expected him to leave. Mm. Lotiriman's fellow Morans have been driving their cattle deep into Samburu County along the Wasongiro. Back in Nairobi, hydrologist Dr. Sean Avery, who's been studying Kenya's water systems since 1979, told me why they'd be going in this direction. That this is a picture of the basin. Mm -hmm which you're familiar with, showing the Lorien Swamp. And this, this is a magnet because mm. when you look at the, the basin there and you yeah. see where the water goes, in the dry periods, traditionally, mm. the Samburu have always moved into areas where there's no this pasture. Mm. These areas here collect water from the Matthews Range, from the Indotos, yeah. from the Milgis Lugger, from the Wasangir as well, but a mm -hmm. lot of it comes in from these other areas. Mm -hmm. So that basin there, is, is a basin which all these pastoralists know about. They yeah. come down from the north, they come up from all directions yes. to exploit those resources. Around here. The Owasongiro feeds into a large catchment area north of Isiolo called the Lorian Swamp. For hundreds of years, this area has been a grass bank for the Samburu, the Borana, the Somali, and the Turkana communities. And the Owasongiro feeds this grass bank. But at this time, a lot less water from the Iwasongiro is feeding into it. Actually, if you look at the uh, Iwasongiro River, uh, the volumes of the Iwasongiro River over the years has been actually going down or uh, uh, going low. This is because of, one, uh, there has been uh, poor uh, 
uh, what we call say feed, uh, drainage in, in terms of feed because uh, this Wasanyoro river depends on the other feeder uh, rivers yeah. but if it does not go there it means uh, actually death. It takes us nearly a day's driving to get to Lotiriman's friends. For any herder, this would be a sight for sore eyes. Healthy herds in their hundreds. Driven by tens of young herders, some of whom are well armed. Just a few meters away though is evidence that the river is drying up faster than usual. It's still early in the dry season, but these young herders will be pushing up further north to areas where other communities are grazing. <laughs> Up north, where they're headed, the Borana and the Samburu have fought before, and it's been deadly. In 2015 alone, 310 people were killed in intertribal clashes in northern Kenya. According to the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, Samburu, where I met Lotiriman and Isiolo, are two of the five hotspots. Most of the men here are well armed, but are unsure about who we are and keep their guns well hidden. But when we settle down in the evening, there's no sign of tension about our presence there. Dinner is prepared in a flash, and we all get to eat after the head of the group of these Morans, Juma Leshekwet, gets his share. Even if we paid for the goat. At dawn, everyone is up and ready to go again. Here in one of the many kraals of the Samburu, the cows are fat and very healthy. And I suspect the kraals of many other communities here along these plains will be the same. It's been a good rainy season and they've been all able to restock. But we're coming to the end of the good times here. And with the end of the good times, grass starts to thin, water becomes in short supply, and competition for those resources becomes even more tense. And with that tension becomes violence that often many people can't resolve and die from. These Morans will graze their herds here a little longer before pushing up northwards towards Borana territory. Juma, the Moran's leader, knows that diplomacy will be very important as they go forward. <laughs> Seasons are changing here. Tough times are ahead. But is that all that's changing? If one looks at the population statistics for Kenya, one of the things that is very striking is that the population growth rates 
in the drylands yeah. is much higher than anywhere than the national average in the country. So although these areas are resource strapped, they have a finite limited resource by virtue of the fact that they are dry lands. The irony is they've been put under much more disproportionate pressure by virtue of very significant increases in human population. According to the last census, the populations in West Pokot, Turkana, Samburu and Isiolo are growing at 5%, almost double the national average. With bigger families, more and different kinds of livestock are needed, and water is getting harder to come by. <laughs> I leave Juma Lechequet and his boys walking into an uncertain few months ahead as they wait for a rainy season that forecasters have said will be delayed. I come back in late October when the rain is supposed to start falling. This time we head into Borana territory. We start at a shallow well in Kina. There's nothing shallow about it anymore. With the rains delaying, people have to go deeper and deeper to get water. Haj Goresi's cattle are getting thinner, but he's holding out hope that the rains will fall soon. We're deep into October at this time two weeks past the estimated period when the rains were supposed to fall. It's the turn of his cattle and goats to drink at the trough. With so many people here hoping to keep their animals alive, everyone has to respect order. And it's order that Hajj hopes will keep communities from fighting. A respected elder here in Kina, he's been part of the team that negotiated the Modogasha Declaration an agreement between the communities living in Isiolo about where to graze. Sasa the declaration isn't holding very well. We're already hearing murmurs about some cattle that was stolen and no one's taking any chances. Haj had to drive his cattle 17 kilometers just to get here. And as I go deeper into Borana territory, I see clearly just how desperate the search is getting. If ever there was a symbol of how badly this region needs water, then this is it. This is or was the Grisa Dam, a water pan that would gather the people of Isiolo County towards it. 
so promising it was that when they'd come here to quench their thirst all those 10 years ago when the government built this dam, the government also set up a chief's office here. Settlements started to come up. It looked as if this region would finally turn around its fortunes with regard to the lack of water. But years and years of drought had made sure that where I'm standing now, where water would reach about my waist, would eventually shrink and shrink further from the edges of this dam and finally go into the ground. And all that's left are cracks. The fault lines in intertribal relationships here are getting deeper as well. Hussein below would know. He's the head of the Kenya Police Reservists in the area and has just come back from resolving a rustling dispute between the Borana and the Samburu. So, Sasa Ngombe, I Mara Kwanza Ngombe and Samburu will report. Aramisi will kill you, Peter. Ngombe Kumi and Punda Tatu. This is Punda Boys, I see Moliziona. I can Ngombe Ziari Tari to Mesha or Samoa Yapa and Benane, like in a Tajaza is able to not talk to Piana Keshoyot. This shouldn't be taken as a small victory. It's progress. Considering that all the communities here are very well armed, the reaction to this theft could have gone very differently. Three <laughs> Hussein is often at the front lines of clashes between communities, trying to separate them when things get violent. He points us in the direction of a place where mediation came too late. She had no livestock, no goat, no cow, no camel. She had nowhere to go. Your pain always talk about Hatiango. I can't go for it. 